So kello, literally in Finnish, means to float. So what we have accomplished and done over the last five years is the first operational unmanned lighter than air platform. So an airship. So it's an old concept, as everybody knows, that airships flew around the world 100 years ago. But to create actually a small unmanned all-weather uh, autonomous platform with lighter than air technology, it's a difficult engineering challenge. So we've solved that over the last five years through iteration, failing fast quite often and frequently to develop this technology and solve these hard engineering challenges to come with that. But what can it do? And that was the original idea that could we have a drone platform for drone service type of business that could stay in the air perpetually or almost perpetually. So just to have the flight time because the drones don't fly that long. And the aerial monitoring, aerial imaging was coming more commonplace. And we started to do that early on with the customers. The customers told us, well, make sure you don't sell any of these airships to them because they're all already dealing with drones and other kind of stuff. So we were with customers very close, close on early on. So we wanted to build a service business using our own platform and technology. So that meant that we needed to have a fleet. And obviously, as everybody knows, there's a lot of satellite companies, new space companies now, a lot of sort of that earth intelligence platforms. But we started to look at some of the challenges that they were having and imagining if we had a 500 airships as a fleet in, in Europe and having this coverage and the performance that these can deliver, we could cover a lot of ground, provide a lot of high resolution data about the Earth by being close to Earth under the clouds. So hence, Kellu is a satellite constellation under the clouds. There's a little bit of pun there for the satellite companies, but that's, that's essentially how we operate. So moving just from the airship platform the business is about operating the fleet. But then the third part of the business is actually the value and the data that we provide. So going from small scale like with drones, small areas, into this countrywide scale, we are enabling real world AI and real world digital twin at high resolution. And by high resolution, I mean one centimeter of pixel level stuff. And there's so much going on in this space, whether that's to do with things from, let's say, NVIDIA's Omniverse or Metaverse type of stuff, into spatial intelligence that's now just starting to deal with multispectral data or non-visible light and, and other sort of type of sensors that what we can do to cover and, and create as accurate representation of physical environment as we can. I can show you a couple of things if you're interested. So for the listeners, you need to go to the YouTube channel just to visualize this because the, one of the challenges we're facing, and we're doing this here in East Finland, we don't have that many people. The population density is still not too huge, but this is really the best place in the world to develop this because we have two flights per day to Joensuu, so we can fly as much as we want <laughs> autonomously, obviously under the regulation with the regulatory approval, but that's helped us to iterate this technology. So this is not CGI, and people will sometimes see the video and ask, when will it actually fly? This is from last summer from our national park where we deliver data to the Finnish government about the national park environment. So the drone can start from the ground base, that can be 100 kilometers away from Joensuu, fly to Goli, into this national park, do day of imaging, and then fly back fully autonomously. We don't have anybody to guide it. The amount of autonomity, autonomous level of flying, is, it's all done with the autopilot, and that's what we developed. But this is too beautiful imagery. Obviously, Finnish landscape is really beautiful. But this is our real every day. So we have snow, rain, and other stuff. And this is actually from a parking lot while it's flying from between cities here in East Finland, over a distance of 200 kilometers between cities. And we can operate also in these Arctic conditions, which is great. So right now we have a factory where we manufacture these. We have operations team that operate, that we're expanding these areas. But this is really what the customers want. It is the data. So we are solving the data through the cloud processing, while the airships fly, they upload the data to the cloud, and we have our own software and AI team that takes all the data from the, from the airships that they produce with different sensors, and then using compute, uh, creates this 3D digital twin of the area that we have done. So this is the national park that you saw from the video earlier, and this is a 3D model of that environment. Now this will enable a lot of really cool stuff that we can talk about. So. Is it, I mean, your product, is it a, a drone 
or also software. What is your product? Well, the product is really data as a service. So we provide data as a service and frequent updates of all the time larger and larger areas until we, until we will cover whole countries with the quality of the data. And as of today, that is being done, but it's being done with airplanes from quite high. The drones are not yet capable of doing whole country, but we do operate under the drone regulation. So we need to go through a lot of small, small holes and, and cracks there to fit the airship, which is rather large compared to multicopters, but small compared to any other airships. Uh, but we have passed that with flying colors. What are the differences between the competitive uh, drones? Uh, I mm. mean, you have already shared that you fly in uh, hard weather conditions, but are there any differences uh, from other drones? That's an excellent question. And often you fall in love with your, with your child, so to say, that you think it as a hammer and everything looks like a nail, that this will replace everything. But in reality, the satellites will be very much used and, and needed, but the satellites are not really capable of the high resolution spatial resolution. They're high, we are close to Earth. We can see also sort of obliquely under the trees, let's say, for example. So we get the side view of the world, which the satellites struggle to get. But at the same time, obviously, satellites can cover very large areas, but they do cost quite a lot. So the unit costs are somewhat similar. If we compare the drones, you have multicopter type of drones using for aerial imaging, and then you have fixed wing or fixed wing and VTOL type of drones. Uh, a lot of kind of established vendors in this space, also in Europe. So some of the things that they try to solve is covering larger areas because the flight time don't typically exceed half an hour, hour in these average real world conditions. They try to go fast. So they are good at going fast, but then it's not always, sometimes it's useful and we go definitely slower in terms of average speeds, but we can stay in the air for more than 10 times longer. And if you want to get a high quality image, and if you, if you have an experience in photography, uh, if you have low lighting conditions, you don't want to shake or move the camera a lot. You don't get very good images that way. So especially when you go into this multispectral or hyperspectral imaging, that means that less of the light is coming to the camera sensor. You're splicing the light into smaller segments, which then reflect in the real world attributes and features of the, of the environment. Then you get less light, so you want to get as much stability and as much light into the camera when you're taking the image. So that means that moving slowly will result and yield better results. Do you use hydrogen? For yes. The yes. So that has been debated for long. I mean, since Hindenburg, everybody knew what happened. And I think it cannot be neglected that hydrogen didn't play a part, but it can be argued when you, when you sort of look at the case that, well, it was only part of that, but it wasn't necessarily even the root cause. And a lot of things have developed since as well. We have a specific solutions that allow us to use hydrogen safely, but we still have a really, really stringent safety culture in the company when we operate, when we deal with hydrogen. But it is an in industrial gas, similarly to nitrogen or any, any sort of inert gases can be dangerous in closed space. So we need to be mindful how do we deal with that. But while you do that, and a lot of other sort of industries are starting to leverage hydrogen as well. Uh, automotive are starting to use hydrogen as a, as a fuel source with fuel cells. And a lot of these technologies and safety related attributes have moved forward. But that is a key enabler because hydrogen lifts more than helium. And helium is a scarce, non-renewable resource. And hydrogen is plentiful. So that does play into the engineering of small, high performance lighter than air platform on an airship. How, how do you secure safety and make it safe uh, product with hydrogen? Are there any patents or are yeah. there any differentiation uh, from a um, classical Zeppelin? There, there are, there are. I think high level you can think, uh, people sort of get an impression that it's a balloon. Blimps, how they're called are balloons, but then you have what's called semi-rigid airships. So you do have structures and you have sort of technical, technical uh, functionalities related to lighter than air platforms, and then you have rigid airships. So the, the old Zeppelins used to be massive, 
like more than 200 meters long, massive, massive platforms. They were rigid airships. So they used gas bags inside. So when the gas is inside the, the airship structure and these gas bags, you want to make sure that you don't mix the gas with air. So if you have hydrogen, if you keep it pure, above 70% concentration, then you're not creating a flammable mixture. So you have these certain areas that if you have a risk of mixing gas uh, into with oxygen, you create a flammable structure or potentially even explosion. So that's obviously the basics of and the fundamentals that we want to avoid. We do have a patent and, and a lot of specific solutions related to this, which I'm not going to expand on, on a public domain. So a lot of this stuff, we had to really, really hard, hardly figure out or think hard about the solutions. How do we create this? But it's getting more and more into industry standard. And hydrogen is also coming back into lighter than air. Other places than, than with us, with Gello as well. Uh, which customers uh, do need these kinds of solution? Well, there is a really a broad range of different kind of use cases for high resolution spectral data or RGB, sort of this 3D digital twin. Um, generally, it's being used traditionally at lower resolution. So whole countries are being aerially monitored. You take ortho, what's called the orthophotos. So basically taking top-down images that you see in the Google Earth, Google Maps, and then you have um, stereo imagery, you have a LiDAR type of point clouds, and now the photogrammetry and also neural radiance fields coming up. Um, so you essentially try to model the 3D world based on these different, different images. And there are different types of applications for each of these areas. But what is interesting for us that Actually, if we work with critical infrastructure or utilities, if it's a power line inspection, if it's a forestry application where we want to know really accurately uh, where, the, where the trees are, how much volume is in their trees, how fast they're growing, um, what is the condition of the, the, the vegetation, uh, the vegetation stress, uh, moisture content, drivability of the ground, for example. These are the questions that the forestry asks. Or if we go to urban planning, that you have... A lot of the government processes related to urban planning. You have generally the design and 3D models and this kind of survey grade. Uh, you want to know exactly where the things are at very high accuracy. But from our perspective, the, the process of getting the data and doing the analysis is same for all of these different applications. There are some domain knowledge when you go really in depth into those that you need to have. And often we work with partners. But in a way, if we look to model the whole country, we will have a lot of different domains and different industries using the same exact data in, in their day-to-day -day businesses. So tell about the team. When did you start this startup? And uh, who is behind the curtain? Uh, how does the team look like? So we, of course, have a fantastic team. Uh, we are very, I would say, international but Finnish-minded. So there's a very heavy engineering focus, yeah, like you would expect from the Finnish companies. Um, we started 2018. Uh, the company was founded by Yoni and Yiri. Um, and I joined a little bit later uh, because I was still running my, my previous business. And we sort of found each other as well um, with, a, with a good fit. But each of us have a strong entrepreneurial background. I've been doing this for more than 20 years now, a little bit more than 20 years. Um, and as with Yoni and Yiri, they have an entrepreneurial background with, with, with successful businesses as well. Um, but then now, of course, we've grown a lot. So since the since the early days, um, the guys founded the company in a barn. So no, uh, I joked that the good companies are always founded in garages, but the great ones in the barn. Uh, but that was the first hangar laboratory in a secret location here in East Finland. There's a great picture in our factory wall when people come in. They see that that well, this is the origin story of Gello where all the first experiments started and they didn't work that well in the first phase, but nobody was there to see that. So it was all, all good. But now we've been able to hire really brilliant people into manufacturing. Uh, Nico, who's leading our, our manufacturing operations, has a strong background with the industry. Uh, Fred came from France, uh, joined our team in operations, leading the operations. I think he could have chosen any job, but he felt that, well, these guys sound so crazy that he needs to come over and see what's going on. And these guys might be actually crazy enough to actually do it. So this is the opportunity of a lifetime kind of to do something 
Um, it's a little bit bold statement, but, but I would say that this is somewhere in the domain what SpaceX did with reusable rockets as a sort of being the first one to do something and having a lot of doubters uh, saying that, yeah, we tried that and it didn't work. Um, so so there's this sort of contrarian attitude with the team as well. But it consists of, of technicians, software engineers, um, really, really brilliant people across different sort of multi multidisciplinary uh, backgrounds and we're all working together. So that's the really, really fun part that you see this challenge and a lot of these different sort of practical engineering problems and everybody's sort of working on them um, really, really jointly. So that's the fun part doing deep tech, definitely. Yanni, you mentioned about your earlier experience as a founder. So what yeah. happened to earlier uh, startup? Did you exit the earlier experience or what happened? Yeah, I, I, I did. But to start a little bit earlier, I actually posted in the LinkedIn a comment today. Um, there, there was somebody writing about, well, actually, it's really good to have more senior founders in a company. So in your 40s, and I'm in my 40s, I do start to feel old. Um, but I reflected there that, well, when I was in my 20s, I started my first business. I haven't done a real job, like I call it, in my life. Um, but the first business was to to send text messages between phones. This is more than 20 years ago. Between phones using the data connection instead of SMS. And we applied for funding. And the funders told that, well, this wouldn't have a future. This is This is a bad idea. This doesn't work. And I gave up. I gave up the first idea because I thought that, well, I thought it was a good idea, but these guys clearly know better. So when I was in my 40s, we started with other couple other entrepreneurs. We set up a bootstrapped SaaS company. So we first sort of created a service business, and then we started to develop our own product using the profits. We kind of didn't understand that, well, there could be potentially VCs to accelerate growth. So we did it the hard way of bootstrapping. So you need to generate revenue. You take the revenue and the profits, and you invest that into a product. And we started to grow international SaaS business. And we applied for funding from same instances. And they told us that your plans are completely unrealistic because we wanted to work with the best companies in the world. So this time when I was in my 30s, I didn't listen to them because I, th I thought that they gave me bad advice before. Uh, so we went and did it. So we started collaborating with, with, with NASA, for example. We got a contract from NASA. That was my dream or customer to work with, dream organization to work with. And we still work with them. Actually, one of their, their, their my good friends now from those days that I got to learn, Charles Camarda, is our advisor. He's a former NASA astronaut. So we started to work with him. Um, I exited the business. So we, we brought in a private equity. Um, I myself stepped out from the business. I'm still in the board of that. Happily retired. And I did feel, to be honest, I, didn't, I, I do think that it was a little bit of mid-life -life crisis that can I be without working so hard, be, without being an entrepreneur in a startup? And I felt that I need to prove it. Um, after a year of not doing so much anything, I was doing quite a lot, but not being in a startup, I started to feel like that maybe I'm I, telling myself that I, I proved myself that I can, can be out of, out of the business. So, so that's when the, we met with the Gellu guys and it was the right timing for me to come in also to invest um, also sort of to bring the experience that I've gathered growing that international business, business before. And I, I sort of summarized that now in my 40s, I'm working harder than ever and I'm having the more, more fun than I've had ages in ages. So this is, this is every day. It's really hard, really hard stuff, working with brilliant team, but this is fun. This is so much fun. What should you advise now in your 40s to younger self of yourself 20 years earlier? <laughs> well, obviously, I think we all saw what happened with the companies that created mobile applications that can send messages over a mobile phone. Like, don't take bad advice as just a given. Do use your own brain to think about and kind of have a little bit of stubborn. But I think it's natural when you're younger that you are much more influenced by advice and you think that everybody else knows things better. So you don't have that self-confidence. And it, it does take time to do that. But I think the second thing, actually working with the, the in, in the bootstrap startup company, 
um, where we grew, grew the international sauce business, I think having other entrepreneurs is so critical that it's a teamwork because it was so hard bootstrapping the company. We always felt that the next year was harder than ever. It was so difficult, but then you have this linear growth that looked fantastic. So when you look hindsight, well, we've actually done really, really well, but it is actually about having the right kind of team with you, whether that's the other founders, other employers. And I think it's like playing hockey. It's like ice hockey in, in Finnish that the teamwork always beats individuals in, in that sense. It's so much strength that you don't need to have all the best players in the world if they don't play well together. And I, I think that that plays well and resonates well as advice for everybody else that you don't need to be the best in the world as an individual, but you need to be really, really good working together with your team. So what is the startup culture in Finland? You mentioned about the East Finland. Are there any West Finland or what is the entrepreneurship ecosystem look like in Finland? I think there's a lot of entrepreneurial mindset people. Um, I, I think there's there's a couple things that are sort of holding Finns back or the Finnish startup scene. Of course, a lot, of, lot has happened in the last 20 years. Things are way different than in the past because we didn't really have any opportunities to go for equity-based funding, or we, we kind of looked at the government grants and, and government-based loans as the only option. So, so having these opportunities to go for early seed investments and angel investors, that's a brilliant resource that we didn't have in the past. But I think in Finland, we're still missing sort of the Series A to Series B and forward, the, the more continuous funding as a VC funding availability. We need to go international, um, kind of where Kellu is, for example, now that it's it's kind of difficult to find from Finland this this kind of experience. But at the same time, Finns are great at engineering. But if you don't have right resources, and this is kind of the mindset that what are the things that you need to accelerate with resources to the market? Because I think there's a lot of great Finnish companies that could have become global sort of big companies, but because they didn't want to go after right resources, they sort of grind it out. They do the bootstrapping like we did in the previous company, and, and it takes too long. It becomes a good small company. It becomes sort of medium-sized maybe enterprise, but it never becomes the large company. But obviously, it's not for all the companies, but I think fin Finland has missed a lot of great, a um, lot of GDP, essentially, a lot of jobs because of that that we don't have the direct access to capital at the right stages and good advice, which are the things that should be accelerated into the market. So I think that's that's kind of the, the startup scene. But the Finns are brilliant engineers. Having, having said that, we're not that good at sales and marketing. So if we compare ourselves to the US counterparts, um, I think we do the stuff that, that we want to, want to do the stuff and have the evidence before we go and sell it to the customer And actually the best sort of kind of compliment for our product is that some other customer tells that, well, we use it and it's great. Um, it, it's very difficult for us to say that, yeah, we think it's it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, it's probably the best in the world, but uh, I'm kind of ashamed to say that. Um, so, you know, this Finnish Nightmares comic where um, Finns have a lot of, pro lot of problems of other people telling how good they are and they get really embarrassed at that point. So... I think that's that's a challenge for the Finns to overcome if we want to play in the global global scene. And there's a lot of great entrepreneurs that have shown the way. We have Supercell, we have other similar companies. Now in this kind of scene, we have Ice Eye Fox, for example, that are brilliant, doing brilliant stuff. Just being boldly there, uh, setting their target boldly, uh, openly that we want to be unique and best in the world in something something that we are doing before they haven't necessarily actually done it. Uh, but now they are there, so so I think that's that's a this my description of the Finnish startup landscape here in Finland. We are things are a little bit more scarce, um, but definitely the mindset is here. Uh, we shouldn't forget about East Finland. Definitely, at certain point, we had statistically like, statistically the most largest amount of growth companies out of Finland. We don't have that many people. We, we had had a lot of great companies. So. You have also raised uh, funding for the startup. What are the difficulties with 
um, uh, uh, investors uh, and their meetings? Uh, what kind of uh, issues that, that you have faced earlier uh, years well, while raising funding? Obviously, finding the right partner, it, it just requires a lot of patience. So, so, so kind of just doing a broad enough, you know, enough amount of conversation is, is like a good, good advice there that you need to talk to a lot of people, a lot of investors. There's plenty of different type of investors in the world and finding the right fit. You don't kind of know when you're going into that discussion for the, for the first time that what is the right fit. You don't kind of have that necessarily a clue. Um, but as you go and progress with, you can start to recognize, well, we actually get along with these guys really, really well. And they understand and they can contribute. This is kind of the, you get an advice that, well, don't actually sort of count so much about the ad, non-monetary value that the VCs bring. I think some VCs or investors can definitely bring in other value as well to advise and recognize it recognizing sort of the patterns from the other companies that, well, you're in a stage where you could at least consider this. Um, I think that's really useful. I guess my critique towards sort of way VC funding works is that I think it goes after easy answers. And this is my reflection sort of towards the investors that if you look at pitch deck and you try to evaluate if this is a good business, I think like in, in marketing or, you know, podcast, we go more towards these long form conversations. So not everything is simple these days. A lot of the simple stuff that's scalable has already been done. And a lot of the stuff that's missing out is actually the hard stuff, which is sometimes complex, which is sometimes if you have engineering, engineering mindset people, they, they're not as powerful communicators. But you need to spend as, a, as an investor, for example, a little bit more time to really dig in if this is the company that is a good company, is this the right team to do that? And having a more long form conversation, I think that would be, it's a time management issue. I 100% know that, um, but I think th there's, there's something more value to, to be brought, brought out through that. Um, what do you think about the Finnish education systems affects uh, the startup mindset? Because, uh, as far as I know, the Finnish education system is different from uh, the rest. So does it affect the mindset? I think that's a really interesting question. Personally, I, I think we've, we've drunk the Kool-Aid a little bit on the, on the education system. Um, we're, we're doing great. I, I'm a firm believer of sort of this phenom-based learning or having a context what you're trying to learn makes it more interesting. I'm, I'm personally, in a way, uh, like a prime example of not getting a university degree and going as an entrepreneur. Uh, I finally got a degree from London Business School 15 years later that I cannot no longer claim to be a dropout entrepreneur. But I, I never found that it's so interesting. I found other things interesting, and I learned those things really well. When I was, I was between kind of 7 and, and 15, I spent a lot of time with computers, learning programming, learning reverse engineering, learning other stuff, how things work. Uh, none of that came from, from school or education system. But I think there's a really good elements on the education system as well. Um, I think it's important that the kids do work, do, do the social exercises, collaboration with other kids, but there should be much more of things that really are uh, something that, that the kids can be passionate about in the education system. So I think that's kind of something that we need to think about. We definitely need to do the hard work when it comes to learning and, and this sort of making the class, classrooms in, into environments where kids can learn. Um, but how do, we, how do we sort of fire up and identify the passion of the kids that they can then go and learn much faster these specific topics? Um, so the educational topics, I, the previous company was in education technology and digital learning, in personalized learning. Um, I know too much about that that area in, in general, um, but I think it's more interesting question for Finnish education is where it's going to go. And I think a lot of people are thinking about it. The feedback from the PISA scores and these others, Estonians have way past us, gone way past us, and we're a little bit embarrassed of that. Um, but the Finns are not the types that will um, will, will 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 be a little bit. Uh, 
sorrowful for, for a moment, but then we go back hard work, put your chin into your chest and towards new disappointments, like, like we say. Um, but I think everything that's happening with large language models, personalized learning, we can shift the learning curves and sort of this retention by far. We shouldn't abandon technology, but we just should go back and look what's not actually working, have real world evidence, statistical proof that what is actually impactful, what's working and remove everything that's not working and, and is kind of counter, counter useful. But I truly think that personalized learning, um, AI based learning assistance and things like this will definitely change the world in the next couple of years. How important, how important is work-life balance? Uh, how can an entrepreneurs avoid burnout? Does it happen to you as well? I mean, that's so difficult question. I mean, um, it's so important and I should be the example of, of that to my rest of my teammates, but some, some, sometimes I feel that I, I do work too hard. My wife does think that and my kids do, does think that, but sometimes you do, do need to crack on kind of, you, you, ha, you need to face these things almost like a yearly clock. But Having a balance, uh, whether that's through exercising, through, through proper eating proper food and sleeping enough, I think these are the fundamentals that you need to have. But as an entrepreneur, it's, it's, it's very difficult to claim that um, you don't always go sort of after. When you have really, really interesting stuff going on, you tend to go overboard a little bit into the, into the work. Um, I think it's a little bit unavoidable uh, from time to time to... Because if things are really, really fun, then you tend to work really hard. But trying to pull back from there and have a good sort of um, buffer into your stress tolerance, into your well-being, whether that's your physical or mental well-being, I think these are really, really important topics. And actually, I, I, I didn't hear these in Finland so much. I heard much more. I used to live in London, in UK for a couple of years, did my MBA there uh, with the previous company. And they were much more open about these topics, mental well-being in the in the workplace. I think that's that's super important topic that Finnish companies should invest much more into. So, who has been the biggest mentor or influence on your entrepreneurial career? I always come back to I, I was fifteen, and this is a very obscure reference. I haven't kind of stumbled into into this, this is not your typical answer. Um, there, there was a website called, uh, run, run by a person called Fiala Ravia. And that was a pseudonym. So the, the person's name was Francisco Vianello. He was an Italian fellow, uh, a linguistic scientist. And he run first a reverse engineering website. And later he founded a website called Search Laws. Unfortunately, he passed away more than 14 years away. But he taught about information searching. So it was a resource website, collection of articles about generally a hacking mindset, reality hacking, information searching, using really effectively the search engines, Google's, uh, Alta Vistas and Yahoo's back, back then, that, that all like us that we had, creating different ways and strategies uh, whether that's short-term information searching strategies or long-term information searching strategies and really kind of fight philosophical approach. And I think that influenced a lot sort of me going into entrepreneurial career because I didn't have close relative examples. I didn't have anybody close that wasn't an entrepreneur. I didn't have that, that growing up, but that gave me confidence that I can find in the internet whatever I want to learn. And I, I sort of learned these skills through that inspiration. My only interaction, unfortunately, he did visit Finland uh, back in the day. I wrote him an email and after six months, he replied to that. And I was, I was sort of, well, this is really cool. And, and I sort of, I have done a course, a lecture around information searching around these topics and told the story quite several many times. I still am baffled that how little this skill is emphasized and taught, for example, in schools. So, so Fiala Ravia or Fravia, Fravia in, in, in short, is definitely one of my most kind of persons that I, I would name as inspiration or, or mentor 
even though we didn't have that physical relation or, or close connection as an entrepreneur. What is your superpower? And if you have a new superpower, what would it be and why? Well, well, I, I think I sort of just described it that from early on, I, I get, sort of gained the confidence to, to teach myself and, and learn complex topics. And if I want to go deep into a specific topic or category of information, I sort of naturally drive into that and can kind of go really deep into specific categories. But I think that's, that's helped me to build a really large context. So if you think about large language models, They've been taught all the information in the world, but they have a short memory. They have a short context. So, so when, you, when you try to be innovative and you solve a lot of different kind of problems within a company, you're doing with finance, you're doing with HR, you're th- building culture, uh, leadership, really tough technical stuff from embedded software into sensors, into autopilots, control systems, big data, AI, programming, cloud infrastructure, everything else. But if you have a large context, you understand enough about all of these different areas, you're capable to make connections between, if we change something here, what it means for the whole system? What are the advantages? What, what, can we, what, what other things we can do in this design space? So thinking this as a complex system of having a large context, um, I've been in the tech, but I never was sort of, just doing programming or development. I did that a lot in secret because um, I, was, I was supposed to do other stuff, but from time to time, I went back to the technical stuff and just code something, do a project there, put my kind of head down and do something technical, which was fun. But ability to do kind of grasp the technical concepts and engineering side of things, I think that's something I can now apply a lot, but then having an understanding of different life cycle stages of the, um, startup enterprise and what's what's really important right now um but that's the, that w- what i would call a sort of, sort of superpower it's really lame in in that sense but um i think that's something i do relatively well and what are some common mistakes you see especially startup founders make uh in your environment and in, in your circle how can they avoid these kinds of pitfalls do you have any advice well, I think it's 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 worth repeating. It's nothing new, but working really closely with customers early on. Customers, surprisingly for startups, they have a lot of patience. I mean, they have much more patience for startups than for any other, other type of companies because these days, a lot of larger companies have worked with startups, but kind of going there and trying something and proposing something, it's the best prioritization tool that you can have. Because you, you can do everything in a startup and everything seems really cool. And this is probably with the Finns and engineers. Like they like to do their stuff and not to tell and not to work with customers because it, it's a distraction. But that's kind of the danger, danger there as well. If you don't work early on with the customers and they will provide you really solid feedback that helps you to prioritize. And they will see things from different perspective and identify value that you didn't even know that exists. So, so kind of being really, really close there. But as a startup, you, you try to do the thing, same things as let's say other commercial companies that have history and have processes in place and have resources. So, so you need to be ready to fail as well in, in that sense. And it, there, there's no shame in that. And long as you're transparent, um, you try to mitigate. Sometimes with the customers, you need to stand on your head to make, it, make your promises true. Uh, make them actually happen, um, but it won't always happen. But you need to do kind of work really closely with customers and try to fulfill as as hard as you can the promises that you make. Janne, thank you very much for insightful answers and thank you very much for this great conversation. Thank you so much.